All right. Um, just a, a couple heads up. Uh, uh, it's been a pretty uh, already a pretty uh, a busy week with advising, so I'll just admit I haven't gotten uh, much yet done on the exam, and I'll go ahead and tell you it'll probably be next week until I finish grading exam two. So, just uh, wanted to mention that. Um, homeworks uh, homework 5.1 is being graded. 5.2 is due today, uh, and then uh, we're going to have uh, a homework assignment uh, assigned today. It's uh, If this is the one I'm, I'm thinking of, I built a few homework assignments in advance, but this one's actually not out of, it's sort of out of the textbook. I took a couple problems. Uh, one of them was from this textbook, and I tweaked it a bit, and one of them was from a previous edition textbook because I just kind of liked it. And so this one, instead of, being, instead of it being like a problem that's assigned out of the book, um, it's just right there on the PDF, so I just thought I'd mention that. Um, one thing, uh, so I'll admit with all the advising and everything, I'm still, I'm a little behind on emails and I'm catching up, but I did get one email from a student and I'm going to put on my associate dean hat because I thought this might be a, a good place to mention it. So um, you all are in the process, hopefully, of scheduling meetings with your um, academic advisors to figure out your schedule for next semester. Um, if you check degree works, uh, uh, you probably are going to notice a new checkbox that asks whether or not you've completed pre-calculus. And I'll explain why. Um, th uh, it largely uh, stems from new federal aid requirements that say you have to take classes within your plan of study. And so the, the, like the civil degree, the mechanical degree, the biomedical degree, et cetera, if you actually read the degree requirements, the math requirements start at Calc 1 but sometimes you have to take pre-calculus before you take uh, Calc 1. So we put that there really to make sure that students didn't have, so that our incoming freshmen didn't have financial aid issues. But if you were a student that didn't need pre-calculus, it looks like a, an unchecked box. You're like, oh, do I need pre-calculus? No, you don't need pre-calculus. Um, what we have to do is for the students that were able to skip pre-calculus, we just need to go in and put exceptions. Um, so don't worry about that. That's, we'll take care of that, okay? so. Everybody good? So does that make sense? So if you see this unchecked calculus box and you think, oh no, I have to go back and take calc one or pre-calculus, no, you don't. You're good. Trust me. Okay. Um, everybody good? All right. So, um, so yeah, I will uh, begin the process of, of chipping away at my emails over the next couple days. I'm actually headed out of town today and I'm coming back Thursday. So if, I, if I'm a little uh, uh, loose in getting back to emails tomorrow, uh, bear with me. Okay, um, we're continuing our discussion of centroids, and yesterday's lecture was really sort of like, okay, let's just do it, let's just go through a centroid problem, um, and, and I, I think that's a, a really uh, a seminal exercise for an engineering student to be able to compute the centroid of a composite shape. Fortunately, or hopefully, you found that computation of, of centroid locations is pretty easy. Like, it's not hard, you know. It's basically just a weighted average. Um, as long as you keep track of, um, you know, where your coordinate system is and you break it up, you know, into simple shapes and handle each shape one at a time, it's very plug and chug. I would argue that uh, centroid computations are very Microsoft Excel friendly. Right, because you're doing it in a table, and it can automate a lot of those computations for you. Um, there's a, a a funny meme, but there is a a, 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 a a significant degree of truth to it that shows an X Y plot, and it shows you know mathematical skills of an engineer as they progress throughout their career, and it starts with like you know counting numbers, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trig, calculus, differential equations, and spreadsheets. And there's some truth to that. So, <laughs> yeah, Excel is an engineer's best friend. Okay, um, to locate the, the center of gravity uh, and to locate the centroid, it's really sort of the same philosophy. We're just computing a weighted average, either of weights of individual components to locate the center of gravity or areas of shapes uh, to locate the centroid. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to extend this definition a little bit. Um, if an area is a two-dimensional region, we can use this same philosophy to maybe say, okay, let's calculate the centroid of a composite volume by taking the sum of x times the volumes divided by the sum of the volumes. So instead of looking at a two-dimensional area, we're looking at a three-dimensional region. 
What we can also do, um, by the way, we are, we'll, we'll you know, still use our, our centroid references uh, 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 for that exercise as well. But what, we're, what we can also do um, is look at the centroid of a line or the centroid of a group of lines or a group of curves. And instead of saying, well, it's the, uh, uh, the, the sum of x times the areas or x times the volumes, it's the sum of x times the lengths or the sum of y times the lengths divided by the sum of the lengths. And there are some very um, real uh, uh, applications uh, of that. So for example, we had a problem a few lectures back where we had, it was when we were doing 2D reactions and we had a crane, right? There was a crane and there were loads uh, hanging on the end of the crane and we needed to determine the reactions to keep that crane in equilibrium. And we accounted for not just the weights that were applied to the crane, but the self weight of the crane itself. We said the crane weighed, I don't know, something like 1,200 pounds and it's acting right here. Well, that particular point was the centroid of the group of lines. We treat the group of lines as if they were you know, areas and, and we do the same thing. Now we can use a calculus perspective if we have, uh, you know, uh, curved segments and whatnot. More often than not, a lot of times engineers are just trying to find the centroid of line groups, of straight line segments. Uh, looking at, at really one of the most common uh, exercises uh, that you'll deal with as engineers is looking at the centroid of a truss. Um, uh, later on, we'll actually do direct truss analysis, looking at the internal forces in each member. But for now, we're just looking at centroids. So this is going to be a real quick example. Um, what we're going to do is I have this region of wires. So instead of this being a solid shape, imagine that this is a wire that's 10 inches long, a wire that's 24 inches long, and a wire that's 26 inches long, three wires. We'll ignore like these little curved regions and just assume they're, they come and meet at a point. And the idea is, where is the centroid of that group of wires? So it isn't a triangle, it's three separate line elements, and we're determining the centroid of those line elements. So we're going to, uh, again, ignore the curved regions and just assume the straight line segments. Okay, the other thing also, uh, I, I put this in here just to say, we'll assume the wire is all made of the same material, it's all homogeneous, and all homogeneous means is that it's not heavier here than it is over here. And there are some materials that are not uh, homogeneous. Like a, a common example of an engineering material that is not homogeneous is concrete, okay? Because concrete is a mixture of gravel, sand, cement, and water. And, you know, you, it, you might have a heavier, you know, your beam might be heavier on one side than it is on the other. But uh, for this, we'll just assume it is homogeneous, that it is all um, uh, consistent. All right. I screen cap that, it always is a little big. So again, I think this is going to be a really straightforward uh, exercise. All we're doing is we're computing the centroid of this line group. So what we'll do is we'll use sort of the same philosophy. We'll say that x bar is the sum of, in this case, x times L divided, oops, sorry, sorry sum of x times L divided by the sum of the lengths, then y bar is the sum of y times L divided by the sum of the lengths. It's really sort of the same process. We're, again, we're just looking at line segments instead of area. So one of the, this is, I think, even easier than what we did last time because it's not like, oh, we have a semicircle. We need to look up the centroid of a semicircle. These are all just lines. We know where the centroid is pretty easily. And so let, let's explore that. Actually, hold on. Let me make that a little bigger. So this uh, wire group, we have three wires. We have wire AB, wire AC, and wire BC. Does everybody see that? So uh, what we'll do is we'll say AB, AC, BC, okay? Let's look at the length first. How long is wire AB? 24. There you go. So 24. How long is wire AC and uh, BC? 26. So if I sum those up, 
I get 24 plus 10 is 34. 34 and 26 gives me 60, right? So now what we need are x values and y values for each of these. Now, um, with this problem, I'm sort of introducing you to, I guess, maybe some more grown-up engineering problems. And what I mean by that is the last problem that we did where I was introducing you to the concept of a centroid, the coordinate system was already defined. But in this, there is no coordinate system. There's no x and y axis. Um, nobody's going to tell you how to do that uh, or tell you where to place that uh, as an engineering analyst. You need to sort of figure that out. Now, I think based on the geometry, there's probably a pretty obvious choice where to place that to make your life a little easier. Where do you think we would place that? Like, I don't know about you, but I'd probably place it at A. You know what I mean? Place the origin there so that everything's sort of in that first quadrant, everything's positive. Um, so what I will do is I will, up, up here, I will say that's the y-axis and say that's the x-axis. So what I'm looking for is that magic point right there. What is the coordinates of the centroid? Okay. Now, what we need to do, though, in order to compute the centroid is we need to figure out the x and y coordinates for each of these wires. And what are the x and y coordinates for these wires? Well, they are the locations of the centroid of each individual wire, right? Because that's how, that's how it worked uh, when we did the centroid of a composite shape. We broke it up into a rectangle, a circle, a triangle, etc. And when we reported x and y, it was the centroid of that rectangle, the centroid of that triangle, the centroid of that circle, etc. Fortunately, with wire elements, it's really easy. Let's take element AB. I propose that the centroid of element AB is just right there, right in the middle of it, right? So what are the coordinates, going back to high school algebra or geometry, what are the coordinates of this point right here with respect to the coordinate system that we just drew? 12, 0, right? 12 along the x-axis, 0 along the y. So just put 12, 0. What about for AC? What are the coordinates of the centroid of that wire, of wire AC? 0, 5. Now, the nice thing also about um, uh, uh, wire segments, and particularly a coordinate system like this, let me erase my little x and y right here. I propose that the centroid of that diagonal wire is probably somewhere like that. How far along the x-axis do you think that is? 12. It's just halfway over, right? What about the y-axis? 12, 5. There you go. This is pretty easy, right? So all you got to do now is have a column of x, uh, of x times L. In this case, it'll be square inches. And a column of y times L in square inches. So again, this math is pretty simple, OK? So x times L, 24 times 12, that's 288, right? 10 times 0 is 0. And 12 times 26, what is that, 312, right? So 288 plus 0 plus 312, what is that, uh, 600? And then for? Y, we're doing this times this, which is 0, this times this, which is 50, and this times this, which is 130, right? So add that up, we get 180. So therefore, So we just take sum of XL divided by sum of X or sum of L and we get 10 inches. 
Same thing with Y bar. Wait, that's 180. So therefore, the coordinates of that centroid are 10 by 3, or 10 comma 3. I'm hoping that's pretty easy. I, 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 I mean, I'm, I don't think I could come up with a way of making it complicated. And, and if I'm being honest, I don't even know that this would be more complicated, at least from a conceptual standpoint, if I extended this problem into the third dimension. What if I had a truss in 3D, right? Well, it would just be linear elements, just their X and Y and Z coordinates, right? We can compute the length of those elements using the Pythagorean theorem, right? And then average the end coordinates to figure out the x, y, and z for each element, right? It's a pretty simple algorithm, right? And, and just so uh, you all are aware, there are very real applications to this, to this type of computation. I'm curious, how many of you have ever been in a Walmart? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> um, Look up sometime whenever you're in, in Walmart uh, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, and what you'll see are a series of flexural elements that are used to support the roof system. Okay? Uh, you'll, and, and what they'll look like is they'll, they'll look like these arrangement of steel members that kind of have these triangular patterns to them. We call those trusses. Um, they didn't just you know, miracle themselves up onto the roof. Largely, what would happen is a crane or some other type of rigging equipment would lift that element uh, up into the air, and then construction workers will uh, bolt that and affix it to the rest of the structure. Well, the person operating the crane needs to know where to pick the element so that it doesn't rotate that much, right? So that it remains stable as you lift it. You know, those things aren't very light, and if they fall and hit your toe, that's not good, right? So. There are very real applications to, uh, to, to stuff like this. All right, any questions? I don't know if anybody uh, uh, lives near out Ona or Milton or whatnot, but they're building this, uh, um, uh, I think it's a bottling plant facility off Route 60, and they've got this big, huge steel structure that they're erecting, and you see all these open web uh, joists and truss elements that they're using to uh, support the system. Okay. All right, everybody good? Now I know that we have biomedical engineers that couldn't care less about bridge engineering, and I know we have mechanical engineers that don't care about building design or whatnot, um, but I'm a structural engineer, and by God, you're gonna learn something about structural engineering. Um, you will learn something about bridges. Um, but I'm joking a little bit, but I do wanna talk a little bit about some practical applications of centroids in other fields. And I I'm going to give you sort of a structural engineering example, but this will have applications in other areas, in mechanical and even uh, biomedical engineering as well. Um, I want to talk about the design of a room like this. Okay. Now, um, we at this point hopefully understand how to construct and mathematically deal with vectors, right? I, I think by now we get it, right? Um, you know, we know that a vector needs to have a magnitude and direction. Uh, we know that a, a vector placed, you know, some distance from a point of interest can generate force and moment. Am, am I correct? Now, here's the thing. We are in this room. How many people are in this room right now? What, 50, 60 people? Do you honestly think that the structural engineer designed the floor system for 50 to 60 individual vectors all pointing down? No, all right, especially given the fact that we're going to leave this room and another group of people are going to come in here and it's going to be a different set of loads. So how do engineers handle that, okay? So I have here an image of a, uh, of a, a sort of like a, a ballroom type facility and you can see all sorts of people in there uh, that are uh, uh, subjecting the floor system to a series of, of uh, applied forces and generating 
forces and moments inside the system. And ultimately, it is up to the structural engineer to ensure that the system is strong enough uh, to, uh, to support this system, because if, if it wasn't, this would be a short party, right? So we wouldn't want that to happen. But a structural engineer is certainly not going to idealize each of these uh, individuals as just a vector, okay? Instead, what a structural engineer will do is they will idealize this entire uh, pattern of load as sort of like a pressure load on the floor system, right? And so what structural engineers do is they use uh, uh, code references and whatnot to, to help deduce what type of loads they need to apply for what types of systems. And I'm using a structural engineering example, but this is going to be very akin in just about any engineering discipline. So for example, um, I'll give you an example. If I'm designing, uh, let's say, uh, a hospital facility, I'm going to have different floor loads for the, uh, the rooms, the, the hallways, et cetera, than, let's say, the, uh, if I was designing a library. If you design a library like Drinko, the floor system needs to be designed for a floor load of 150 pounds per square foot. Whereas if you're designing like an office building, the offices only need to be designed for about 40 or 50 pounds per square foot. Why are we designing libraries for more load? The books that college students never read, right? So <laughs> is there any truth to that? They're like, no, no, we read all the time. <laughs> But the idea is that, <laughs> what was that? Well, you check books out at the library for free, come on. Woe is me, yeah, and, and the, the emotion I have pouring out for you, it, it is, it is. Okay, all right, all right. I've had my limit with all these calculus jokes. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, all right. So, what what engine? So, <laughs> all right, back to statics. All right. So, what engineers uh, will do is they will idealize this as, for example, a pressure load, or instead of a single vector, what we call a distributed load. And distributed loads can take all sorts of patterns. For example. If I'm looking at, let's say, a floor system in a building, I might have a distributed load as just sort of this uniformly distributed uh, force. Like the idea is like, here's my beam, and that beam needs to hold up 500 pounds per foot. So the idea is like every foot, that's another 500 pounds on the beam. Another common distribution of loads that you'll see are hydrostatic loads. So um, pressure in, in you know, hydrostatic bodies like, like a body of water. As you get deeper, the pressure goes up. So if I'm trying to design some lateral system to support some fluid, like a dam, for example, then the pressure distribution is going to increase as a function of depth. So the, the force that that dam has to hold up is going to get greater as the dam gets taller, as the water gets taller. Does that make sense? But then what we have to do as engineers is we have to deal with this. This isn't a vector. This doesn't have a single position with a magnitude and direction. This is some triangle thing. What the heck do we do with the triangle thing? I know what we do. We figure out where the centroid of that triangle is. And we determine where the centroid of that triangle is, and we use that to apply a load that has static equivalency. So for example, let's take this problem. I have a beam that doesn't have a vector on it. It's got this weird distribution of loads. It's got a, a distributed load that goes from 1,500 newtons per meter to 4,500 newtons per meter, and it linearly increases, so it gets heavier along the beam. And the beam is six meters long, and I need to determine the support reactions. We've never done a problem like this before, so we, can't, we couldn't have done this before because we didn't have this wonderful tool called centroids. So what we're going to do is we're going to tackle this problem. We're actually going to tackle it two ways. Okay? Um, the first way uh, that we're going to handle it is we're going to say, Let's take this load and let's uh, handle it as just a rectangle and a triangle. Handle it separately. Then what we'll do is we'll say, no, no, no. Let's compute the centroid of this region and handle it as one load. And you will get the same answer because the centroid is where you place that resultant such that the load has static equivalency. That's the whole point. OK. Let's see how this works.
Don't make fun of calculus. It's so integral to what we do. What's that? I got a series of these jokes. Don't you worry. <laughs> I'm a dork. It's okay. You know. <laughs> I love my job. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Let's take a look at this. <laughs> let's take a look at this beam. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, split this up first off into two separate load effects. So, I have. So, what I want you to do is I want you to treat this as if it's an area. Treat it as if it's a, a geometric region. So, if this is 1,500, let's say units tall. Let's say this measurement is 1,500. And this measurement is 4,500 units tall. What is this dimension right here? 3,000. Okay. Okay. So let me show you the first way that we're going to handle this problem. So we'll say method one, components. All right, so here's the beam, okay, and let's put our roller support right here, and let's put our hinge support right here, and these are going to have reactions. I'm going to call this reaction AY, and I'm going to call this reaction BY. Now, how many unknown reactions does this have? Two, right? But there's no forces going to the left or right, correct? So that horizontal reaction is zero. So I'm just not going to worry about it. So I just wanted to say that. The professor in me felt like I needed to say that, but the engineer in me says, I know it's zero. I'm going to move past it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I hope this is coming through on the screen. So what I want to do for method number one is I'm going to handle this as if it's a separate rectangle and a separate triangle, okay? And like any vector, I need to determine the magnitude and location, Like right? I know the direction. They're going to be acting downward, but I need to know where the magnitude is and where I'm going to put it. So let's deal with this uh, component right here. Let's deal with this. We'll call it the... Uh, Let's call it this. Let's call it the rectangular component. Okay. You said this is 1,500 and this is 3,000. And we know that this dimension here is six meters. Okay, so help me out. Let's take this rectangular component. How? Tell me the formula. How would you compute the area of this rectangle? How would you do it? The 1500 by the six. So let's look at that from a unit's perspective. I'm going to call that R1. 1500 newtons per meter times six meters. So what are the units going to be in the end? Newton. So it's a force, like a vector. What's 1,500 times 6? It's 9,000. 9,000 newtons. Now this is a rectangle. Where do I? Where is the centroid of a rectangle from, let's say, this point right here? How far over? 3 meters. So I propose I can place... a 9,000 Newton vector three meters away from A, and it will represent the same static equivalency as that rectangular component. Does that make sense? Now, if that makes sense, let's deal with the triangle. Let's look at the triangular component.
Okay. So what's the area of the triangle? One half of base times height. In this case, the height is not 4,500. It's 3,000, right? So I'm oh, sorry. I hit. I said it's not 4,500. Here I am putting it there. And so what is one half of 3,000? It's 1,500 times 6 is, again, 9,000 newtons. Now, so I propose we can place another 9,000 newton vector. But how far? Let me ask this. Let's, let's put the dimension over here. How far from B do I place that vector? Two meters, right? A third from the big N, right? So this dimension is two meters. So now I just have a beam with point loads on it. This is something we can handle. This is just forces and moments. So I propose what we can do is we can sum moments at A, and we can take those moments as positive, and we get what? Uh, negative 9,000 times 3 meters minus 9,000 times 4 meters plus by times 6 meters has to equal 0. So this is 27,000. This is 36,000. And then we'll move this over onto the other side. Is it okay that I'm going through this part kind of quickly? Like this is just algebra. Hopefully this is pretty simple. So negative 27 and negative 36, that's 60, or 63. And so therefore, by is positive 10,500 newtons or 10,500 newtons up. Is that okay? Like, I didn't do that too fast, did I? Okay. If Let's just see if we can do some quick mental math. This is 10,500. What's AY? Anybody know how we do that? No, 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 not 63,000. We're summing forces in the y direction, right? 18,000. <laughs> Let's do it formally. So, so summing forces in the y direction, taking upward forces is positive, so AY is positive, minus 9,000, minus 9,000, minus or plus BY is zero, so AY is 18,000 minus BY. AY is positive, in this case, 7,500. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? I'm going to show you method two here in a second. So. But everybody good? Okay, all right. Let me show you method number two. All right, do I need to leave this up here for a sec or can I scroll away? Okay, I'm going to take that as I can scroll away. All right, so method number two, actually, let me, let me lower this a little bit. Method number two is to use the center or use the resultant and centroid. So
Now we know what A, Y, and B, Y are. We just did it. But let's say we didn't, okay? Let's say we hadn't done A, Y, and B, Y. Well, what did we do just now? We had this Something like that. So what had we said? We said that we have a 9,000, a 9,000. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slap a coordinate system onto this thing. Okay. So we'll say my x and y axis begin over here at point A. And help me out with something, okay? Okay, we know that the beam is six meters long. This distance over to the first one, didn't we say that's three? Is that what we said? Okay, and so if that's three, would that make that four? because it was two from this end, right? This was two, so that makes that four. So I propose that R1 is 9,000, R2, 9,000, and then what we can do is we can say X1 is three meters, X2 is four meters, and what we can say X bar is the sum of Rx over the sum of R, which is R1x1 plus R2x2 over R1 plus R2. Without doing any math, can anybody guess what the answer to that's going to be? Three and a half, right? Because we have two equal vectors, one's at three meters and one's at four meters, so the static equivalency should be right smack dab in the middle, which it, it does. It works out that way. Because if you take 9,000 newtons times 3 meters plus 9,000 newtons times 4 meters over the sum of those, What you're doing is you're fat and you factor out the 9,000. You got 9,000 over 18,000, which is a half. A half of three plus four, half of seven is three and a half. So, so what we can do is we can say, I don't want to deal with two loads. Instead, all I want to deal with is a single force of 18,000 newtons placed three and a half meters from A. And now let's compute reactions of this beam. And so this is six meters. And so now, if I sum moments at A, I'm going to get negative 18,000 times 3.5 meters plus BY times 6 meters is 0. And so BY is going to be... Uh, 18,000 newtons times 3.5 over 6. And what is that? Should be 10,500, shouldn't it? And so if we sum forces in the y direction, now we only have to deal with this. 
So there's two ways of going about a problem like this. You can take each constitutive component or you can compute the centroid of the whole load and just deal with one vector and one load. I, I don't really know which one's more efficient because it depends on the shape, right? If you have a really funky load distribution, it might make sense to deal with that first and then do the statics. So just depends. Any questions? What do you think? This isn't so bad, right? Okay, I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what's coming next. So you're going to have a homework assignment. If you understood this, I think your homework assignment is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, what's going to happen on Friday is uh, on Friday we're going to look at centroids of volumes and conceptually no more difficult. I think the only challenge, the only thing you really got to watch out for is whenever you're doing centroids of volumes, you got to make sure on your bookkeeping that you're not double counting some areas. So like if you have like an L-shaped bracket, you know, like you got to make sure that you don't overlap the rectangles. I, th I think that's probably the hardest part. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little bit off to the side. Um, what, we're, uh, what we're incorporating here from calculus land, since it's been such a, uh, a fun uh, uh, little uh, uh, exercise of our pun skills, is we're incorporating what's called a first moment of area. And a first moment of area, so if you integrate a function with respect to x, that gives you the area. But if you integrate x times the function, that's called the first moment of area. The second moment of area would be integrating x squared times the function. Now, we could get crazy with it. We could integrate the 47th moment or however far we wanted to go. But in engineering, there, usually you find that there's really only two that are useful. The first moment of area is useful because it helps us determine the location of the centroid. The second moment of area is useful because it generates a numerical property called the moment of inertia. Um, admittedly, the moment of inertia doesn't have a whole lot to do with statics. It is more a mechanics of deformable bodies concept because it will tell you the efficiency of a cross section under bending, right? It's like when you go to your porch in the backyard and there's the, um, the, the wooden uh, joists that are supporting the floor system. There's a reason that they're facing up like this instead of like this. It's because along this axis, the, uh, the, the wooden two by 12 or whatever has a larger moment of inertia. Um, the reason why we're um, doing it in here is because if you understand the algorithm to compute a centroid, it is such a natural extension to do moments of inertia right after it. Because it just it, it makes sense, you know, to just go ahead and do it. It is something you will utilize later on in your semester and uh, or later on next semester. It's also just a valuable uh, tool to have at your disposal to be able to compute moments of inertia, um, uh, et cetera. So, for example, if you had uh, somebody who had, I'll try and throw a biomedical uh, uh, example. If you had somebody who had bone degeneration in their arm, for example, and they lost some uh, uh, surface area, for example, uh, or so, some of the uh, uh, bone degeneration on their arm, you could compute the moment of inertia of a bone and determine how much uh, stiffness they lost in their arm, for example, as a function of that bone degeneration. For you mechanical engineers, moments of inertia will help you determine whether or not elements are going to support bending loads, whether or not they don't want to buckle, all sorts of things. So that's what's coming in the next couple lectures. After that, we start handling some structural analysis. That's all I got. I will leave you to your calculus funds. <laughs>